Hello, it's Karima here. Welcome back to my channel and to my series about advanced witchcraft, uh, the book by Edine McCoy. Uh, today I will be talking about the second part of this book, the fire chapters. So if you haven't seen uh, the first part uh, where I was talking about the air chapters and uh, about the preface, about the beginning of this book and about the circumstances, how did I get it and so on, uh, please uh, check uh, out the link here in the corner and uh, watch the first uh, part of the series as well. And uh, if you are back now here, then welcome. Let's jump into the fire chapter, which is the main topic of this uh, video. So we are starting with the chapter five, uh, which is about the worlds, the three worlds or four or more. And uh, straight away, I draw a little picture here with my pencil. Uh, with a few words that just came on my mind immediately. It's like a shamanistic uh, view of uh, the middle world from which you go down to the down world and then up to the upper world. And uh, then uh, here is the world about which I, or the view on the world uh, that I learned about in Ireland when I lived in Ireland and I was practicing there with witches. Um, the view of three worlds, the world of uh, land, sea and sky. And then uh, I have here uh, the tree with uh, nine leaves, which uh, goes to the Nordic mythology of uh, Yggdrasil, of uh, the Axis Mundi of this tree. So I believe that in this chapter, it was uh, really like aligning with uh, my views and with my uh, take on the worlds. I think that one uh, big thing that came to me was that we can't really capture those worlds like uh, something that is 2D that we can really just like draw uh, and or something that is 3D that is something that we could like model and uh, capture. I think that it's something more that they are really going through each other and they are like all connected and uh, going um, between themselves and connect in many, many, many different ways that we might not be really able to just draw or model or show. Uh, we may never know all the worlds uh, that exist uh, indeed, they might be uh, infinite in number, but we can explore many of them and learn from them. So that's uh, like a great thought that uh, Maybe each of us is able to reach some different worlds a little bit as well. There are some that are visited by people for centuries. There are maybe some that are created by people if we are thinking about like uh, online world and this kind of things. Uh, so definitely uh, other worlds are something to reach, something to visit as a witch. I think it's uh, one of the big uh, uh, things, one of the big parts of our practice. Uh, reaching the other worlds, so unless you are in a spirit form, the other world has to be accessed via guided meditation or astral projection. Also, I would say that through hedge witchcraft, shapeshifting, shamanistic journeys, you can also uh, go to another world to reach these worlds. Uh, here is a lovely, lovely list of uh, brain wave activity, of uh, beta, alpha, theta and delta waves. Uh, really, really nice, especially for those of you who are also walking, uh, working uh, with uh, lucid dreaming, uh, astro traveling and with dreams in general and dream journaling. This can be something to really go in depth to. Here it's a, a lovely, lovely uh, page about it, uh, which is just uh, writing the basic information about it that we should probably already know anyway but uh, it definitely has a place here um, then uh, here's uh, a little bit on witches broomsticks and sacred herds uh, it's absolutely absolutely great there's uh, like a uh, thoughts on the broom and thoughts on the chimney and I absolutely love the symbolism of this I wrote here also with chimney I wrote here also Santa and uh, Harry Potter uh, as uh, another kind of uh, ways how to view chimney and it's uh, 
its uh, own uh, symbolism, its own correspondences. Uh, each mind is a universe unto itself, one in which you are or should be the supreme ruler. So uh, this is a really nice sentence that we basically perceive the world from our perspective and we create our world around us. That's what we see from the world. So that's our world because no other being can uh, experience the world through us. Uh, it's us who are experiencing it the whole life long. Uh, but I would say because of uh, we are aware or we are controlling only about 2% of the brain activity that we are not really a total supreme ruler, but we are definitely trying to go into our mind uh, and so on. Uh, yeah, uh, the three world concept, uh, she's thinking here about uh, the different concepts of worlds in Celtic mythology and Norse mythology and so on. The tree was a sacred number to many uh, people. It's again something that makes sense uh, in a repetitiveness for our brain. Uh, then uh, different studies on uh, on uh, religions, uh, on cognitive uh, religious mo cogn cognitive approach to religious movements are working with uh, these uh, kind of sacred numbers as well and uh, researching them that uh, some things just uh, make more sense or make more balance for our uh, brain, for our view. Uh, four world concept with the spiritual world, mental, astral and physical world are here as well. Uh, I was trying to connect them with elements just as an exercise. Uh, there are different approaches to it. And then uh, here it starts uh, to be that interesting stuff uh, of uh, other worlds and parallel universes. Because here it's starting to be those circles that are interconnected, that uh, have something in common, that uh, are not just just like bubbles next to each other but are connected in a way and that's uh, absolutely great. One last note that I have uh, on this uh, part of the fire chapter is uh, that here is written you are always in control of where you go and with whom you interact uh, where I would slightly disagree because uh, in real life um, we don't really always uh, we know where we go but we don't always uh, affect uh, with whom we will interact. Uh, not uh, every interactions are uh, chosen by us uh, or sometimes we meet somebody whom we fear, sometimes we can't hide from some people or sometimes we are just simply pushed uh, to go through the crowd of people and so on. So. If it's like this in a real life, why in other worlds it should be different? Why in other worlds we should be somehow protected and in control of everything if it's not going on only in our head, of course. Uh, also, here is a sentence, perhaps the world we enter upon physical death depends upon what we believe in life, which you can read also in the books by Terry Pratchett, which I can also recommend. It's a lovely fantasy book. Uh, it's vital to your advanced practice that you have a map in your mind of the cosmos and how it's put together. you advanced in your practice, uh, you will find more reasons to work in other worlds and less to work in the physical with your usual tools, which is absolutely true. So this uh, sentence basically made me to start drawing my map to kind of put it more together and uh, also I can confirm that I'm using less and less uh, tools in my practice and I'm also quite often coming back to those that I was using on the very beginning and I find them the best working for me. So that was the last uh, note that I had on this part and now we are going into another lovely philosophical topic on how many selves have I. Uh, so for me, uh, when I went through this chapter, I found out that me and the author, we have a little bit different uh, approach to the self. Uh, I view self as uh, something uh, that is whole and that has uh, 
let's say many faces or let, uh, that has uh, many parts uh, which can be activated uh, as well as uh, in a, for example uh, Germanic uh, mythology where you have this soul that is connected from different parts some of them are animal spirits, some of them are your other gender self, some of them are your ancestors and all these uh, kind of energies are creating yourself, your soul. Um, so all these uh, kinds of self, my spiritual self, my physical self, my physical body and this, these other selves for me are unity, for me are one self that has different parts uh, with which we can work. While the author just sees these as different separate selves. For me it's similar to those worlds that they are just interacting constantly and that we can't really exactly separate one from each other. Uh, but anyway the selves are really nicely explained uh, here and there's uh, loads of different uh, takes uh, on the self. Uh, as well with this I can go back uh, to my idea of invoking the triple goddess. It's uh, again that it's not different selves, it's uh, different uh, parts and different faces of one self, of one goddess. So that's uh, how I simply uh, view it. So. Here I had loads and loads uh, of uh, notes uh, and uh, I was trying to put it uh, together. How do I see uh, those selves that uh, Edine McCoy mentioned uh, here? Uh, so here were some lovely questions that I was answering for myself. How many of myself are alive and well and living in other worlds and times? Uh, do they haunt me? Do I haunt them? Can we better communicate? Are we on the same spiritual path? And uh, is any of them dangerous to me? And, uh, and other questions, uh, which again is uh, a nice uh, place here in the book to write the answers for these questions before you dive into the text about uh, different selves and the approach of the author. Because again, you can first uh, see your own view and then find it uh, linked with uh, another ideas uh, from the author. So here we have uh, the one theory for selves about physical, astral, mental and spiritual body. Uh, there are some archetypal selves in here that there's like the co-worker, there's the fetch and there's the shadow self. So this is absolutely great that these are mentioned here and uh, explained. And uh, with the shadow self, uh, the author goes more in depth uh, I absolutely agree with what she's writing here. It was really like um, on my kind of uh, wave, on, uh, on my uh, way of uh, viewing it. Uh, entering the shadow world is another uh, lovely page that can help you to work with your shadow selves. Then here's, of course, obviously, um, a chapter on a reincarnation, uh, which is... Uh, uh, another thing that is usual for witches. For me it's more, it's rather recycla recyclation. Uh, and uh, the author writes here, reincarnation is a basic tenet of witchcraft, though not a requirement, which is really, really nice. Uh, somebody from the teachers uh, just told me that it is okay, that I don't uh, believe in a reincarnation, that I believe rather in uh, some kind of cycle of life that my body will kind of rot or will just dissolve as well as my soul at some point and they will just transform in another thing. The author is also mentioning several reincarnation theories, so that's another amazing thing that she's showing that there are different points of view and different approaches uh, to it. And she's of course also mentioning uh, the part about exploring your past lives and how can it help you in your practice and so on. The next uh, chapter is Advanced Warding and Psychic Self-Defense, which is my totally very, very favorite chapter so far. I find it very, very useful, even though there was again uh, a part uh, with which I led loads of discussion uh, between myself and the image uh, of uh, the author of Edwin McCoy. Um, because of the ghost portals and uh, ethics of their closing because uh, here's uh, definitely uh, written uh, 
about locating portals between worlds and also what to do when you find them and there are uh, basically uh, suggestions to close these portals, close these uh, door that used to be in some wall before the wall was uh, filled, before the door were filled with bricks or panels and uh, before it became the whole wall, uh, that these used to be dark and still work for uh, the ghosts to travel through and that we should uh, close them. Uh, I slightly disagree with this. I in general don't really like to uh, approach uh, ghosts in uh, any kind of uh, uh, way which would be keeping them on some specific uh, space but again it's uh, just uh, my way of working with them my way of working with them is more uh, friendly approach and uh, focused on uh, helping them on their path as well and they are quite often also able to be like warding the place and helping with uh, the energy there as well. Uh, of course there are ghosts with which you can't really become friends but uh, usually it can work uh, that way on that astral level and also I find it absolutely stunning and amazing that uh, basically when we go in a uh, astral realm that we can travel uh, into different time when in this world was the portal and we can go through that portal or we can even go to the time when uh, there were no walls and no buildings at all and this way is uh, how the traveling through the walls and through other objects work um, in uh, astro traveling for me that I'm basically choosing the time frame when did this not exist uh, so I choose the time against the space against the place so that's uh, my way of uh, going through the walls and going using exactly these portals that here in the book is suggested to close so that was uh, one of the things with which I was uh, leading some kind of discussion inside of uh, my head while reading it. There's uh, something about solar plexus armor, the checkered box, which is absolutely amazing way of uh, protecting ourselves or our um, magical space of our ceremonial space it uh, is based on some masonic rites which uh, was really really interesting for me there's also a little bit about the witch's foot and uh, also something about uh, animals, about warrior witches and if there's uh, really uh, something like harm, none and uh, she's not mentioning here the butterfly effect but uh, of course uh, our freedom uh, starts uh, where the freedom of someone else maybe ends so that's uh, basically that we always live in inside of some kind of society and uh, it's really hard to truly not to harm none because every of our action might harm somebody because of the chain of reactions on uh, this action it's basically something that we can't really avoid always yeah uh, also, there's uh, loads of talk on uh, ethics uh, in warding ourselves and so on, but I believe that everyone can see ethics differently and can everyone can feel ethics differently and present their ethics differently. We all have a uh, different kind of uh, approach to the world, different kind of uh, point uh, of the view and uh, also our ethical values or ethical code might uh, vary. So that's uh, another idea that came uh, on my mind and through these ethical things uh, we are coming to binding for self-defense and uh, creating your personal bodyguards and home guardians so again here it is uh, about that how much is it okay to uh, bind somebody for my protection or if I can rather do some kind of a ritual that would pump my energy up and uh, lower down this way that energy of the other person or the impact of the other person and uh, I've personally never been to the situation when it would be so harsh that I would really have to bind somebody sometimes I have to cut off 
some people, some energetic uh, lines and uh, ropes between us, but it never happened that I would have to bind another person and I personally would not want to be binded or bound by magic. So that's why I don't do it either, even though there are many ways how to do it and uh, I would be able to, but no, nah, not for me. Uh, and uh, about uh, personal bodyguards and home guardians, again, then it depends on uh, with which energy we are working, if uh, the ghost is okay with it, if the spirit of the place is okay with it, and so on. Uh, so, loads of uh, rather ethical kind of values and ethical thoughts were popping up uh, with uh, this amazing chapter. It's followed by the chapter on uh, Wiccan shamanism. Uh, this one wasn't uh, that uh, much... Uh, uh, in depth for me or it went into depth but uh, it wasn't that much uh, something that would be super super interesting for me uh, there's of course shamanism and its history use of the psychotropic uh, drugs uh, dream incubation and uh, interpretation which is interesting indeed uh, the gift of prophecy and there's the gift in uh, uh, the lines because it's not always a gift uh, to to know things. Uh, deeper connection with the spirit world. So uh, there's actually um, a little bit about 33 isles of the other world, uh, which is something about which I've never heard before. I've never learned anything about it before. And I asked my friends who are into Celtic mythology and they didn't know it uh, either. And uh, though here is uh, loads of really interesting uh, names of uh, different isles and uh, their gar guardian spirits and inhabitants, it is interesting indeed, it is something that you will not find in uh, every book, but rather for those who are um, probably into like Celtic myths and uh, maybe some nowadays interpretation of it, uh, because uh, I still didn't connect it with it any other source, this information. Uh, soul healing and the wholeness is as well part of this chapter. Uh, also there is sacrifice, and uh, the role of suicide in shamanistic culture. And then we are moving into uh, the talk about animal allies and helpers, and that's uh, the end of uh, this chapter. So this chapter was rather for me uh, going on the surface of uh, nowadays modern new age-ish shamanism, uh, while I'm more interested in those old uh, ways of, for example, seder or that kind of hedgecraft and uh, shapeshifting and these kind of parts. But again, it's uh, about personal preference of everyone. Uh, following is uh, the chapter on the animals and shapeshifters. So that's something that was again really, really super interesting for me. And uh, yeah, it's absolutely great that she's starting here uh, with uh, that point of view that uh, animals are so uh, tuned uh, to the cycles of the nature and to the way the nature works and that loads of us have uh, a little bit of this also when we are children and then basically the civilization and society is just wiping it away from us and uh, we are still connected to the nature but not as much as animals and animals can actually help us to come back uh, to it. There's about uh, animal totems, allies and familiars and connecting with your power animals and it's step by step uh, how to do it uh, to go into the meditative stage, to always have some kind of goal for this kind of journey, uh, to talk with uh, that animal and uh, let that animal to walk you back uh, to the beginning from which you started the meditation and always be thankful about uh, what uh, was going on, be thankful towards the animal and uh, sense if uh, the animal will allow you to call upon it uh, for further guidance. So sometimes uh, there comes an animal in the meditation that is here only for some specific short time or only one time. Sometimes it's the totem animal that is coming nearly always to guide you, to help you on your journey. And of course, uh, make notes. The magic of the 
shapeshifters, uh, the chapter that is really, really interesting for me, and the many faces of the shapeshifter. These uh, two parts of this chapter, of the last chapter of Fire Folder, are absolutely amazing. I absolutely love to read on shapeshifting because the shapeshifting is something to which I came uh, through basically my experience uh, rather than through reading something. And uh, now there's uh, finally some words uh, written on the paper uh, for me. Uh, about uh, shapeshifting and about uh, its uh, types. Uh, there are some uh, uh, different uh, reasons for shapeshifting. It's quite connected to astral projection as well here. Um, and uh, there's uh, two uh, lovely uh, sentences or two lovely uh, kind of rules uh, that when you change, everything around changes. Uh, which is one of the great rules of uh, magic and of how does it uh, work, how can it work, how soul magic works. And then here is when things around you change, you also change, either in contrast to it or in harmony. So that shapeshifting is happening us to, uh, to us all the time. We are constantly <coughs> changing, evolving and or devolving sometimes, but we are constantly changing and shifting our shape, the shape of our soul, uh, but then there are those other steps of uh, changing the shape of our aura into some kind of animal or some kind of plant or any other natural thing or maybe also other thing based on uh, for how long and which way are you uh, practicing. There are uh, lots of reasons. It can be for the experience, it can be for visiting the other world, it can be for protection, it can be uh, to find your true self, your true name, and it can be also for connection with deity or gaining some kind of awareness. There's uh, really just a short uh, part of the chapter, but again, full of information that that's something that I really, really love on this, on this book. Uh, also, there's a talk about different parts of uh, the body that can shapeshift. There's uh, the talk on the body, on the mind, on the spirit. Um, there's also uh, several different uh, shifts written. It's a full physical shift, full astral shift, uh, the spirit body shift, the mental body shift, uh, bilocation shape shifting, which is uh, quite interesting. And we can again find something like this in uh, Terry Pratchett's uh, books on this world and the uh, dream world shift. So uh, again, we are coming back to that uh, dream world, uh, which is going through this whole chapter a little bit. There are those uh, brain waves, there's uh, the dream world, there's another note uh, on uh, dreams. So this uh, chapter in comparison to the very philosophical air chapter is uh, much more connected to our instincts, a little bit of intuition and to our connection uh, with the nature through our instincts and through our feeling ourselves and the world. So that's uh, the second part of uh, my series on this book. I can't wait now to start reading the water chapters because I'm always trying to make the video or I want to make the video always before I will dive into another part. And I hope that you enjoyed it and I hope I will see you uh, with the next video on water chapters. See you soon, so...